You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be doomed of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you save my soul. We're so glad you're here. If you will, let's stand and worship this morning. And I was lost. When you came for me, held in chains by the enemy, but you broke them in victory. Now I'm free, I am free. You're my joy, and you are my hope. I am saved by your grace alone. I will sing of your love for me. I am free, I am free. My God has saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you save my soul. Now I stand with the King of Kings. He has paid for my every sin and from now through eternity, I am free, I am free, you have saved my soul, I am yours forevermore, I won't be moved of this, I'm sure, you are my God and you save my soul. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved on this, I'm sure. You are my God and you save my soul. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you save my soul. Jesus sought me with a 
stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. As we continue this song, I wanted to help, as the song says, to lift our praise this morning by reading Psalms 150. And it goes like this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And as we gather this morning, that command is to us as well. Let us to come together and let's praise the Lord this morning. And oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. And let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. From to wander, Lord, I feel it. From to lead the God I love. And here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Teach me some melodious, teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love.
God, as we come to you this morning, as we come to worship you, um, Lord, I pray that we would lay down whatever things that we carry from our week into here. God, we lay them down at your feet, knowing that you are over those things, and as we come this morning, that you would be our focus and our attention. Um, God, I lift up the, the message this morning, the different worship that we do, um, and I just pray that you would be our intent and uh, our focus. And so, God, we lift up all these things to your name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. You may be seated. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? Man, it's great to have you all here. Let me offer up a word of welcome. Uh, any guests or visitors that might be joining us this morning, my name is Jeremiah Smith. I'm the pastor here at University Baptist Church. I don't really sound quite like this. I'm fighting off allergies. Anyone else? Yeah. Can I get an amen for allergies, right? Uh, it is definitely that time up here. And so uh, bear with me, though. Uh, we'll be able to power through it. But I am sincerely glad to any guests or visitors that might be with us today that you're here. Uh, and we want to welcome you and continue to encourage you during this season of your life. And so if you could take your phone and scan the QR codes there on the back of your pew, that'll prompt you to fill out some basic information that allows us to follow up and get to know you if that's something that you would appreciate or desire. So please make time to do that today, because uh, we would love to tell you a little bit more about our the church. Uh, obviously, we just sang about what it means to come and do the will of God, and that's something that we want to continue to focus on and commit to each and every week, each and every day of our lives. And when we think about what that tries, or how we try to in the life of this church, uh, we often focus on three different things, discipleship, healing, and justice. Uh, we want to be disciples, make disciples, and that that's a foundational aspect to everything that we do in the Christian walk. Uh, we want to be a place for healing, recognizing that people go through a lot of different things, that it, it is hard navigating this life, and so we want to be a place where you can come and acknowledge those difficulties, those challenges, and, and find people that are going to love you and walk alongside you and lead you towards renewal and healing. Uh, and we also want to be a place in a people that, that loves justice, uh, that we want to really advocate uh, for the oppressed, for the marginalized, the hurting, and we tend to zero in our efforts on that in the arena of foster care and adoption, that we really want to be uh, a light in the midst of darkness and make a difference in the world around us. And so uh, these are the three things that, that we try to articulate uh, as a vision of our church. What we hope that ultimately results in for all of us is that we have a regular practice of knowing and proclaiming the saving work of Jesus Christ. That that's, that's the essence of, of what we want to be as a church. And uh, we recognize that part of that pursuit is a daily offering of ourselves, a daily giving of ourselves and surrendering those things uh, to the Lord so that we can pursue those things passionately. Uh, the scriptures tell us that where your heart is or where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And so uh, we also want to encourage you to make giving a part of your worship today as a demonstration of your discipleship and your commitment to Christ. And so you can scan the other QR code there on the back of your pew uh, and prayerfully consider what that might look like for you today, recognizing that it goes beyond just the giving of sacrifices, but giving of your time, your heart, your talents, your devotion, just giving yourself as a living sacrifice to the Lord in pursuit of this and our ability to, to declare, not just in song, but with our lives, that it will be done in our own lives. And so we pray that that's a big part of what you as we worship together today. Uh, we also have some things on the horizon, some announcements that we want to make you aware of and call your attention to. Uh, not one that we're coordinating necessarily, but who all is ready for the eclipse tomorrow? Everybody got a place to watch it. Should be an exciting event, and I uh, know we'll be looking forward to it up here as a staff. Uh, I trust that you'll have a place to be as well. I've noticed all the signs on the highways, like expect delays, so I'm not sure what kind of crowd we'll get, but should be a unique opportunity for all of us. Uh, but beyond the eclipse tomorrow, there are several things that our church is going to be focused on that we want to call your attention to. The first will be next Sunday uh, on April 14th. Uh, we are going to be having an informational for the Cambodian mission trip. Uh, that is very committed to missions, uh, very committed to taking this gospel around the world. And uh, we've been serving in Cambodia for an extended amount of time. And so coming up in the fall of 2024, we'll have another team going and serving. And so if you uh, feel stirred to, to pursue that sort of call and you want to go and, and help share this gospel with the nations, we would love for you to at least stop by next Sunday uh, and get uh, some basic information about what that might look like and, and what that opportunity uh, could be for you. And so it'll be next Sunday after church. Uh, following a little bit later on April 19th, we're going to have a mommy son luau. Uh, we love creating spaces for uh, intentional time within the family. 
a lot of times we'll do like a daddy-daughter thing or a mother-son thing, and then we'll switch it and do a daddy-son and a mother-daughter. Uh, we try to do that sporadically throughout the year, and so we have mommy son luau coming up on the 19th and so look for more information on that on the in the next few days and you can obviously reach out to martha our children's minister and she can give you those details as well but that should be a lot of fun it'll be the 19th six o'clock here in harris hall as the slide shows you and then an important uh, thing on the calendar that we want to make sure everyone is aware of on april 21st uh, following church we're going to have our minor protection policy training uh, this obviously is very important for anyone that works within uh, children's ministry or it really youth ministry as well, anybody that works with my. Uh, but we extend this invitation to the whole church because the more the whole church understands our policy, uh, the, the safe environment we are able to create as a church family. And we would definitely want to take that priority to make sure that we are caring for uh, all the children and the youth that are entrusted into uh, the leadership and the care of this church. And so... Uh, the 21st, following our time together in worship, uh, we're going to spend some time reviewing that policy and making sure we have clarity on what all that looks like. Uh, this is something we try to do at least once a year, and so we would encourage you to carve out time to join us for that on the 21st. So those are some of the things that are on the horizon. That really kind of covers the extent of my announcements today. Uh, we normally uh, transition to a time of a children's message. Uh, one of our key convictions here at the church is that we see families are are valued, and so we always try to create space within our worship service to to create an age-appropriate message for the for the littler ones that are with us today. Uh, we're going to forego that today, uh, and so we we will transition in just our normal spirit of worship. But for those of you that might be guests or new, if you have children under the age of kindergarten, uh, pre-K and younger, we have what is called Little's Church, where they're going to be able to be dismissed and go have more of an age-appropriate lesson. And so if you're a guest or visitor, you can go join that leadership out in the hallway there, and they'll give you more details on that. But uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and ask our littles to feel dismissed, and the rest of you, let's stand and let's continue in worship.
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we do declare just the sweetness which comes uh, with knowing you and trusting you. And yet we acknowledge before you this morning, Father, that that trust is not always easy. And, and so for anyone that's here this morning, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts that are wrestling with trust. Perhaps, Father, any of us that are here today overwhelmed with worry, uh, that have questions or doubts, certain struggles or hardships that are distracting us from our ability to trust you, God. We want to acknowledge those things. We want to confess them before you, and we want to surrender them to you. And we want to all rediscover just the incredible sweetness that comes with knowing you. Knowing that you are Lord, knowing that you are Savior, knowing that you are the author of our lives. And so, God, we, we come and ask that your spirit would move us. It would stir within us. Father, that in all our ways we could acknowledge you, knowing that you will direct our paths. And that you are worthy of such trust. You are worthy of such devotion. God, I pray that our time in the scriptures today would only further solidify this in our hearts. God, that it would speak to us as only your word can, aided by the power of your spirit, that we would be refined and sharpened and changed to better live out our commitment to you. We thank you for a gospel that compels us to sing, a gospel that compels us to come and to worship, to pray, to study. We pray that it would be exalted and lifted high in this moment for you and for your glory. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you all. You can be seated. Okay, so for the last several weeks, we've had some microphone issues. Some of you all have probably noticed that. And just a minute ago when I was up here announcing, it was cutting in and out. Correct? Did y'all hear that? So we're trying another one. Uh, but just so you know, uh, we have been trying to work on it. We think it's like the frequency or something and not just the pack. But all this to say, should you be interested in serving in the media ministry and have a certain skill set for that, we would always welcome uh, anyone that feels so inclined to lead and to volunteer. But we are working on it. Hopefully this, this will be uh, consistent and sustained. If not, then I'll just move to Warren's mic. I will not be singing, uh, but I will use it uh, to, to get us through the rest of the message. So uh, I can't believe that we're just in the first week of April and we've already celebrated Easter, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that we're already uh, having Easter behind us and still have the whole month of April ahead of us. And yet I love this time of year. This is my favorite time of year in a lot of ways uh, when you get to go through the Easter celebration. And one of the things that I've always said, uh, not just to our church, but really just kind of throughout life, is that the gospel demands a response. Right? It's impossible for us to hear the story of Jesus, uh, to hear the good news of Easter, and not respond to it in some form or fashion. It demands a response. And, and so when we get through Easter, kind of the idea of how we try to facilitate that as a church is to create space for us to think through, well, what is our response to this gospel? Right? We, we've just celebrated the resurrection of our Lord, the incredible story that it offers. And so how are we going to respond to it in our own lives? And, and so here's the idea of what we try to do. When you think about going through the season of Lent, we provide this Lenten devotional that is usually there to kind of help you focus on your own relationship with Christ, your own understanding of what he has done and what this gospel really holds. And, and through that journey, not just on Easter Sunday, but all the days leading up to it through the season of Lent, we have an opportunity to really reflect upon the commitment that Jesus has demonstrated to us, right? A, a commitment uh, to be willing to offer up his life as a sacrifice on the cross. It is a remarkable demonstration, demonstration of his commitment and his love to us. And so when you think about our response to him, it carries that similar connotation, that similar question, what is our commitment then to Christ? And, and so what we've typically done is we, we try to identify a Sunday somewhere in April, uh, sometime after Easter, that we refer to as Commitment Sunday. And it's a time for us to really be intentional about asking this question of ourselves and of one another to say, what is our response to this gospel? What are the commitments that we feel like God is laying on our hearts? 
And this is something that we intend to do hopefully next week and, and really try to acknowledge that sort of conversation. So we don't make it into this big event or this big celebration. What we do is we create this, what we call a spiritual questionnaire that we will send out by email as a way for you all to have some thoughtful exploration into this question in this sort of a discussion. And, and so when we send it out, it's, it's not intended to be like this five minute Q&A quick survey. Uh, we really want you to receive it in the spirit of, of a devotional, right? In the spirit of, of prayer and reflection, kind of the spirit of the psalmist who says, search me and know me, God, test me, know my anxious thoughts, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting, right? And so we want this to be a thoughtful time where you are alone with the Lord and you have a chance to really reflect upon your response to this gospel. And so we send out this, this questionnaire and it's built upon kind of two things. It's really built upon the key convictions of our church and the vision of our church. And so when you think about the key convictions, uh, a lot of the questions that we send year in and year out, they have a very similar flavor to them, right? They, they have a lot of similarities from the previous year because we recognize that a lot has changed in your life from one year to the next. And so this is just kind of this annual rhythm, this annual check-in for you to ask some of these very important questions about the convictions that we want to have as a church family, right? These values that we want to aspire to. For example, we're a gospel-centered church. And so some of these questions will speak to, okay, how is the gospel informing your life? Is your life really centered on the gospel? Or we'll talk about our key conviction of being biblically guided, right? So what is the scripture doing in your life right now? Do you have a consistent understanding of the text and rhythm of being in the Word of God. We want to be prayer driven with an emphasis on fasting. So we have questions in there about our prayer life and what our prayer life looks like right now. We talk about discipleship focus, that that is the foundation of what we do and that is the foundation of who we want to be as a church. And so important questions about what that looks like right now in your life and how you're pursuing those things. We talk about worship. We talk about giving holistically of ourselves, not just financially, but just offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. We talk about families being valued and what these rhythms look like within our own homes. We talk about being a part of a loving community that loves the community. Right? So we have all these questions that speak to these key convictions. And then we, we include additional questions and thoughts about where we feel like God is leading us as a church. Ways that you can offer up responses in your life. Things that you may feel like God has uniquely equipped you to do or is stirring within you. Ways that you want to maybe serve and get connected and plug, plug into the ministries of this church but also continued clarity about where we see God leading us in these arena, arenas of discipleship, healing, and justice, and, and what your, your commitment is to those things and how that is speaking to you in this season of life. And so uh, we, we prioritize this, and we would encourage you to go ahead, take this next week to start praying to that end and thinking about these things. Be looking for that questionnaire to probably come out next Sunday once we get it all up to date and ready to, to, to provide to you all. And, and embrace it accordingly. And what I would tell you is that as you prepare for it, let me just reiterate some of the reasons why we do this, okay? Uh, first and foremost, like I said, is that the gospel demands a response. And so this is a, a, an intentional way for us every year as a church to create the space for you to have that personal assessment. Like we want it to be highly personalized for you, for you to really reflect upon what your response to what Jesus is doing in your life should look like. So that's the first thing, is to give you that space to have that annual assessment of what God's doing in your life. The other reason we do it is because we hope it encourages you to engage in the mission of God and the mission of this church, right? That if God is stirring something within you, that if you do feel uniquely equipped in some specific way, that you have the opportunity to be encouraged to pursue those things and, and to have an understanding of what that looks like here, right? So we, we want to be a church that's active. We don't want to be a consumeristic uh, church culture or church body, right? We, we want to engage in the mission of God, and we want to encourage that sort of commitment. The other reason we do it that I think is really, really important is that it creates mutual accountability, right? And so I, I really want to emphasize the idea of mutual accountability, because there's obviously a degree of accountability that we're, we're wanting to encourage you to make sure that you're um, uh, working on a consistent time of being in the Word, of, of being in prayer, all those different things. But when you really embrace this sort of exchange, this sort of questionnaire, and you're candid and you're transparent and you're honest, like it holds us accountable. It holds me accountable. We've had some incredible conversations with people to, to recognize where 
where we're missing the mark, why people aren't feeling as connected to a sense of community or, or where we've maybe missed the mark in certain relationships. And it's created some very meaningful and constructive dialogue so that we as the church leadership can say, okay, this is, this is what we need to do. It holds us accountable. That mutual accountability is so valuable. So we, we want your transparent and honest assessment and, and feedback as you go through these things. It helps us maintain that same accountability. And then the last reason is prayer. It, it gives us such a unique opportunity to pray over you all. Uh, when you submit this questionnaire, it, the uh, answers ultimately come to myself and the ministers on staff, and we take time, uh, take turns kind of responding uh, to the questionnaire. And as we do, whenever it's our turn, we kind of rotate through it. I mean, we pray over you all. The, the prayer requests that you have an opportunity to submit through this questionnaire, like we, we take that seriously, and it gives us a very focused opportunity to pray for you all by name in a very thoughtful way. So there's a ton of value in it, and, and I would encourage you to embrace it um, and then look into that uh, this next week as we really try to collectively as a church it, walk through this question together. What, what is my response to this gospel? If I've seen this commitment from Christ, what's my commitment to him? And so we look forward to that conversation. Uh, but as we move into the month of April, we're actually also going to be starting a new series. Now, we finished up our series last week by looking at Psalm 22, uh, which was a way to kind of cap off this journey that we've been taking for the last couple of months of looking at all these different genres of psalms and seeing the wide array of different postures, situations, and circumstances that the, that the psalmist brought to the Lord as a posture of prayer and worship. And by looking at this wide variety of emotions and, and approaches to prayer and worship, our main thrust, our main argument was to say, God is the safest relationship in your life. Right? There, there is nothing that you can't bring to him. No emotion, no situation, no circumstance. He truly is the safest person in your life. And so you can allow anything that you're going through to be channeled and fostered into a posture of prayer and worship. And that was kind of the main thrust of the whole series. And we brought that to a conclusion last week by looking at Psalm 22, uh, which so beautifully captures the spirit of the Easter weekend as it takes us from this journey of anguish to assurance, right? From lamenting to thanksgiving, from pain to joy, from darkness to light, from death to life. And, and so we, we had an opportunity to bring that to a conclusion. And so now, as we head into the month of April, we start a new series. And I would tell you, I'm very eager for us just to camp out in the New Testament. Uh, I love the Psalms. Uh, I love the Old Testament. Uh, but coming off the heels of Easter, I love being able to have us some space and some time just to focus in on this gospel. And so what we're going to do is we don't want to just run by the story of Easter. Right? We want to do more than just allocate one Sunday to it and, and have this celebratory declaration of He is risen. We're going to dedicate the next several weeks to really reflect upon uh, the impact and the significance of the resurrection of Christ, right? To really understand it for, for all that it offers to us. And so we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, and we're going to look at the three different resurrection accounts that you see in Luke's gospel in chapter 24. So for today, uh, for example, we're going to look at the women's account and, and their arrival on the empty tomb. Uh, the next week, we're going to take a look at Jesus appearing to the men on the road to Emmaus. And then the week after that, we'll, we'll see what we can learn from Jesus making his appearance to the disciples before finally ending the month with just the final uh, discussion on Luke's uh, discussion of the ascension of our Lord at the end of this gospel. And so we'll have a chance to look at all three resurrection accounts and the ascension of Christ. It will allow us to really stop and reflect upon the significance of the resurrection. Now, this isn't necessarily going to be a series that is designed to be apologetic in nature. What I mean by that, like we're not going to try to prove the, the evidences of the resurrection, though some of that will come up from time to time in our discussion, but we're really uh, more after what does this mean for our lives? How, how do we respond to the significance of Jesus being raised from the dead? And these three different accounts, plus the ascension, will give us a lot of different things to consider and a lot of different viewpoints. So each week, We'll have a specific theme, right, that we think is very relevant to that particular resurrection account, okay? And so this week's theme, when we look at the women uh, coming up upon the empty tomb, I've got a slide for the sermon announcement, I believe, that you may have seen earlier. 
uh, we called it prone to wonder, searching for Jesus. Now, I know there are handfuls, maybe dozens of you out there right now wanting to whisper to your neighbor, they misspelled wonder. Um, we did this on purpose, okay? This is borrowing from the line that we just sang earlier in, in the song, Come Thou Fount, that says prone to wander with an A, which means deviating from the path, right? Uh, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, that kind of wandering. That's not what we're talking about. We wanted to make this play on words because we knew that phrase was somewhat familiar, but we're talking about wonder, right? The idea of uh, questioning, curiosity, being puzzled, confused, right? That sort of interest, that, that wonder of what happens and how when we wonder about things, it leads to a searching. You're going to see here in a little bit that this is a very consistent theme in the women's account of discovering the empty tomb. And so what I want us to really focus in on is kind of a central idea of this message today is the power of wonder and how significant it really is because wonder is what typically fuels and leads to searching. And when you start to search in the right way, with the right spirit, with the right posture, it is not uncommon for that sort of searching to lead to life-changing discoveries, right? Incredible discoveries. Think about like all the greatest inventions that, that we probably could identify as being very life-changing. You think about the invention of the telephone or electricity and how so many of these inventions started with that spark of wonder, right? So back in the early 1900s, for example, there are these two brothers that owned this bicycle shop. And, and they began to be moved by this question of wonder. They, they started looking at how birds flew in the air. And they noticed that the way that birds used their wings for control and, and for balance and all these different things, uh, they began to wonder, can that be possible for humans? And so they wanted to search that out. And they, they tried all these different ways that that might be possible. They developed this concept called wing warping. And, and as they built upon that idea of trial and error, searching, 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 they eventually took this concept of wing warping and merged it with the idea of a rudder that can be controlled. And then they discovered the magical formula of flight. So that on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers successfully conducted their first attempt at human flight. It was a small plane that went uh, 852 feet, just shy of three football fields, for 59 seconds. A remarkable accomplishment, obviously for 1903, and it was truly life-changing, right? So life-changing. Think about how that technology has progressed today. The advancements within it and how it is continually shaping our world to the point now that, that the longest flight that is available to us goes from New York to Singapore, and it lasts 19 hours. More than 9,320 miles. This, this discovery allowed that sort of life-changing impact where the flight went from 59 seconds to 19 hours. From 852 feet to more than 42 million feet. It's remarkable. That's the power of wonder. Right? That's the power that happens when wonder leads to searching. And searching ultimately takes us to this kind of life-changing discovery. And this is especially true when it comes to the gospel, isn't it? Because we're all prone to wonder when it comes to Jesus. We all have questions that should spark our curiosity and ignite certain questions and uncertainty that hopefully gives rise to a searching, especially when we talk about the resurrection. Right? Isn't that something that we should wonder about? How is this possible? How can the dead be raised? Like, shouldn't this fuel our wonder? Shouldn't it prompt some level of searching? And my hope is that as we really look at the way that this unfolds in this account in Luke's gospel, we will be reminded that in that sort of wonder and in that sort of searching, it does indeed lead us to this life-changing discovery. And that essence of that discovery is a hope that never perishes, spoils, or fades. It is a hope that lasts forever. And so I want us to take a look at it. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to have an opportunity to see how Luke presents this 
initial wonder and searching through the account of the women who go to visit the empty tomb. Starting in verse 1, here's how the text reads. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them, who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. All right, so a lot of things about this account that I really, really love. And my approach to this text is, is to do it this way, is for us to first just kind of understand what's transpired, to kind of walk through it uh, systematically here. And after we've walked through it, to ultimately end our discussion today by applying it to our lives and asking how some of this informs our own understanding of wonder and searching for Jesus, okay? And so the first thing I want to call your attention to in verse 1 there is that all four Gospels— when it comes to an account of the resurrection, know that it took place on the first day of the week. You see that there, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. Now, what's the significance of that? Uh, in fact, a lot of people would point to this as some form of evidence for the resurrection. Because just as a reminder, uh, at this point in time in Judaic custom, the end of the week would be Saturday, right? Uh, the Sabbath was on Saturday. That was day seven. That was when you rested. Sunday was the first day of the week. I think a lot of times, uh, just instinctively, we, we might view Monday as the first day of the week because we look to Friday, Saturday, Sunday as the weekend, right? And then work and school starts on Monday. But in reality, especially at this point in time, Sunday was the first day of the week. And so the reason this is significant is that all of Christianity, right, especially the early church, shifted its worship off of Saturday onto Sunday. Which is not insignificant, right? The reason that's, that's significant is because being a, a religion, so to speak, or a belief or a worldview that found its origins in the Judaic faith, right? If there wasn't something significant that happened on Sunday, worship would have continued on Saturday. But the fact that so much of Christendom shifted its time and its devotion to worship on a Sunday tells us that this early church, the earliest believers, believed something remarkable happened on the first day of the week. So remarkable that it changed their whole rhythm of worship. So it was the first day of the week. All four Gospels account for that. It's early in the morning. And you have women who are coming to the tomb who will be named later in verse 10. You can go ahead and refer to them now. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others. They are going to the tomb because they have prepared uh, spices... Uh, that, are gonna, that they're going to go and offer up on Jesus' body for his burial. You could go back up to the paragraph that concludes chapter 23 and see that this same idea was referenced then, that the women had prepared spices and perfumes that they were going to take to put on Jesus' body, but they waited uh, and rested on the Sabbath as they were commanded to do. And so now this is their first opportunity to take these spices and the perfumes. And this was their custom, right? This was the routine. This is what you did for a dead body. Uh, the perfumes and the spices were there to combat the odor that, that accompanied a corpse, but it was also a way to honor the deceased, okay? And, and so that's what they're doing. They've gathered their spices, uh, they've gathered uh, these perfumes, and they are looking for a dead Jesus, right? They're going to the tomb. At this point in time, there is no wonder, right? Maybe there's grief, maybe there's despair, uh, maybe there's a, a disillusionment, but they're just operating out of habit. To them, Jesus is dead. 
and they're just taking the next steps that they know as a gesture of this grief or as a gesture of honoring his body. And as they approach the tomb, what do they discover? Again, something that all four Gospels point out. When uh, they found the stone, when they had prepared and went to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And it is here, with the rolling away of the stone, that their sense of wonder had to be ignited. Right? Like, like that had to have caused some form of a question. Right? Why was the stone moved? That was different. And again, the stone being rolled away is not evidence or proof of the resurrection, but it is significant. Right, because this is where the wonder begins to be ignited and they begin to ask their question. They begin to get a sense that something has happened, but what? Now here's what's significant about this, is that the wonder that is ignited here leads them to search more intently for Jesus. They could have come across the stone, saw that it was rolled away, and thought to themselves, I'm, I'm going back. Something is amiss. Something is off. I'm, I'm not moving forward. I don't understand what's happened. We need to get help before we walk any further. But it didn't, right? Th this initial evidence of the stone being rolled away ignited a wonder. So what did they do? They go into the tomb. They search for Jesus. So they walk into the tomb. And what does it tell us? They tell us that they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus there. So now we have a missing body. Now, I, I want you to think about how that just further intensifies their wonder. Right? They're questions. And, and I want you to put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their place. Because at this point, though the stone is rolled away, though there is no body, they are not going to automatically assume that Jesus has been raised from the dead. That's not on their radar. That's not what they're thinking at this point. There are so many other logical conclusions that they would probably assume at this stage, just like you would. Right? They, they're probably standing there in that moment going, who did this? Somebody's taken his body. Was it the Romans? W was it the chief priests and the elders? Did they do something just to add to our pain, to further dishonor our Jesus? Right? Did somebody else that we don't know take him to, to protect him? Where did he go? They wonder. Right? And that word wonder here, as it's applied to the women is a sort of term that means puzzlement, right? Uh, uncertainty, doubt, right? They have all these evidences, so to speak, but they can't make sense of them, right? It doesn't, it doesn't add up. And it's there in the midst of their wondering that the angels appear. Now, Luke doesn't refer to them as angels, does he? He says two men. But the description of these men give us a pretty strong indicator and clue that he sees them to be angels because they're dressed in gleaming white clothes, right? Clothes that gleam like lightning, and they suddenly appear. And so the fact that you have angels that arrive and that there's two of them, that is also significant because at this point in time, things were verified uh, by the validity of two witnesses, right? It, it added to the credibility if there were two. And so Luke has pointed out that it's not just angels, but there are two of them to, to add validity to what's being said. And so how do the women respond to the angels? Further evidence that they were angels? Well, they bow down in fear, which is a common response, according to the scriptures, whenever a heavenly being or an angel presents themselves before man, right, or, or woman, right, that the response is one of fear and worship. And so they bow down, face to the ground, and what I love about this is that it is that posture, right, it's that position of humble fear and reverence and worship where the first Easter story is shared, right? The, the first time the human heart hears these words, the position is one of worship and reverence and fear as the words of the angels come piercing into their hearts. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here He's risen. What a remarkable message. And I want to stop here for just a moment. Right, just a moment before we get back to the, the story of the women and, and what follows next. And just remind you, this is the essence of the gospel. He is risen. Right, this is the message 
that moved from village to village, town to town, generation to generation. It is a message of hope. It is a message of an everlasting hope. It is a message that death has been swallowed up in victory, right? It is an incredible message that you and I must not deviate from even today, right? Long before there were sermon series and messages curated around doctrine, right, and all these different questions of morality, questions about church governance and men and women in ministry and styles of worship and, and things related to uh, morality and purity and purpose and mission. Before any of those things existed, the essence of the Christian faith, the message of almost every sermon was very simple and very profound. He is risen. The resurrection changes everything. It is the essence of our faith, and we cannot depart from it. Right? This is that life-changing discovery that death doesn't win. And this is the message that is spoken over these women in that posture of worship. Now, as they receive and hear this message, we get something unique in Luke's gospel here. Uh, the angels go to greater extents to explain why this has happened. And they actually call attention back to Jesus' prediction of his death res and resurrection. And, and what they do is they summarize three different parts of Luke's gospel. Uh, rather than rereading the summary, I'm going to draw our attention back to the moments in Luke's gospel where Jesus predicted these things were going to happen. Okay, here's essentially what the angels are pointing back to. Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Luke 9, 43 through 45. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, but they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Luke 18, 31 through 34. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. They did not know what he was talking about. I think another way you could say it is they wondered. Right? They were confused. They were unsure. And so the angels, having declared this, this Easter message, this, this life-changing hope, they speak to the women and they say, don't you remember what he told you? And they summarize these predictive teachings that Jesus had earlier in his ministry. And what does it say? Then they remembered his word. And it's there at that moment that for these women... This wonder, this searching, gives way to this life-changing hope, right? Everything changes from this point on. And what we see before we kind of walk through the next phase of this story is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the place for revelation and understanding, right? This is the moment where everything begins to click, where these puzzle pieces begin to fit, and it all begins to make sense. Right? It, to put it another way, the resurrection is the one place that truly satisfies our wonder. And it's not just true for the women. It's true for you and me today. Right? Whatever it is that prompts us to wonder, to search for meaning, to search for significance, to search for hope, right? any other pursuit, any other search that leads us anywhere to anything other than Jesus, we ultimately come up empty. We will remain unsatisfied. We will continue to wonder. But it is only in this gospel, only at the essence of the resurrection, that we find that wonder satisfied where all of it begins to make sense. When you truly begin to understand and embrace the idea that Jesus is raised to new life, it changes 
everything for you. It changes how you see the world, how you serve others, how you understand purpose and meaning and significance. It is here at the empty tomb, this power of wonder, this, this searching for Jesus, that when we find the resurrection, that all of it begins to make sense and we find this life-changing hope. And so now, with that discovery, these women are changed. Right? They, they are now fueled by this hope. They, they remember these words. It starts to make sense. So what do they do? They go back to tell the 11. Right? And so we get their names and, and we see that they go back and tell the 11 all the things that had happened to them. But what's the response of the 11? It's really interesting. Right? Now the women have changed from seekers to messengers. And we get to see how this first Easter message that was declared, kind of in some ways your first missionaries of the Bible, right? These women who go and proclaim a resurrected Christ, we get to see how that message is received. And 10 out of the 11, what do they do? They dismiss it. Now, it's, it's worth asking why. And one of the things that is also no noteworthy in the gospel accounts with the women often being those that are first declaring this message, is that if you go back to this point in time, the testimony of a woman was not seen to be as credible. Okay, and the reason I point that out is because if the idea of Jesus being resurrected was a manufactured lie, right, that something that we're just going to create to help verify or validate all the things that we were doing as disciples, or, or somehow we were just going to come up with a story that makes us feel better about what happens when we die, like, if you were going to try to make this up and get people to believe it, you would not choose women to be the first ones to see it and account for it. Because their testimony wasn't seen to be as valid at this point in time. It, it automatically loses credibility. So the fact that Luke admit, it like incorporates that, acknowledges it, actually adds to kind of the, the rationale and the probability that it happened this way. Right? It, it wouldn't make sense to make it up this way. But even that being said... What, what we can see is that it's not as if the 10 out of the 11 dismissed this message on account of the fact that they were hearing it from women. That was not the case, right? Jesus had affirmed a certain value and credibility to women. The disciples had seen that and known that. They knew these women. Why did they dismiss it? Well, the text tells us because the message, the content of the message seemed like what? Nonsense. <laughs> no way. For them, Jesus was dead. And so your, your discussion, your story, this message, there's no way, it's nonsense. And so they don't even wonder. They don't even try to search. They just move on. Except for Peter. Right, for Peter, it ignites something in him. He is compelled. He has to see it for himself. So he gets up and he runs to the tomb. Kind of making a similar mistake as the woman. He, he's still looking for a dead Jesus. But he runs to the tomb and he finds similar evidence, doesn't he? He finds the stone has been rolled away. He sees that there is no body. What's different, what's different for him and the women's experience is that the women found angels. Peter found strips of linen. And there was something about that contrast that spoke to me as I was reading it. And, and what it spoke to me is that in our searching Sometimes we don't really know how God's going to speak to us. Sometimes he sends us angels, and sometimes he just gives us strips of linen. Right? And, and we don't always know. Sometimes we go in our own pursuit, our own search for God, and it is clear. He might as well have sent an angel to speak to us, and we know it to be true, and we move with a certain conviction. And sometimes in our searching, he just gives us a little clue. One more shred of possibility that we have to work through and process and pray through. And, and try to understand, and that's what Peter had, right? But he, he was searching. And as he picks up those strips of linen, how does the text end? He walks away wondering to himself what had happened. Now, what's interesting here is that this is a different word that's used for wonder, right? The women had a word that spoke to the idea of uncertainty, doubts, kind of being bewildered and puzzled. This is a wonder that speaks to being astonished and surprised. Right? There's almost like a, a sentiment of joy and enthusiasm that's associated with Peter's wondering. 
But, but make no mistake, his journey is just like the women's, where it has been propelled and moved by wonder. And he has been searching accordingly. Now, as we read through the rest of the account, we'll see how his searching is ultimately satisfied. But we're going to stop there today. And, and let me offer some concluding summary statements here and then apply it to our lives. The first thing that I want to tell you is, again, we're, we're not going through this series in an attempt to have an apologetic discourse on all the evidences that defends the proof of the resurrection. However, in studying these resurrection accounts, there are certain elements that I want to accentuate to you that helps add to the credibility of the story. Right? You have uh, the total shift from Saturday to Sunday as significant. Something significant happened on that day. The stone was rolled away in all four gospel accounts, right? Something was amiss. There was no body, right? There's, there's no account of them being able to say, here's the corpse. Here he is. It is gone missing. And that has to be explained. That has to be understood. And then you have the women's testimony, right? That the fact that it was women who were first telling this, this, would, this does not tend to lend itself to be a lie that would be made up. It adds to the credibility of how Luke is presenting the story. So a lot of things just in our study of these first 12 verses that, to me, give some credibility to the idea of what we have been able to have handed down to us for thousands of years, that Jesus is alive. But the real reason I wanted us to walk through this today is to see how this applies to our own life, our own sense of wonder, and our own sense of searching for Jesus, with the hope that we are able to also make that life-changing discovery. To find this hope that never perishes, spoils, or fades. To find this living hope. And so here's, here are the lessons that I want to close us with today. And it, and it really kind of comes back to a question of, what is Jesus to you? Right? It, how you answer that question will influence what you're wondering about and how you're searching for it. And when you look and break down elements of the story, you see a lot of different ways that that question is answered. And I wonder which one most applies to you. For example, for some of us here today, Jesus is nonsense and he might as well be dead. Now I realize the fact that you're here at church probably lends itself that that isn't a high probability that you wouldn't necessarily just automatically dismiss it as nonsense or that you think he's dead. But I also know that it is possible that you're here and if you're really honest with yourself, that's really what you believe. Right? That this whole Christian faith, this whole idea, it just doesn't make sense to you. And you haven't really wondered about it at all. You're like the other ten. Right? You, you just cast it aside. Right? Jesus might as well be buried in a tomb. And if that's you, I want you to ask yourself why. Right? Are, are the questions too big? Are the doubts too strong? Are there wounds in your life that you've experienced from the church or other people that associate with the church that have cut too deep? And so why even consider it nonsense? I think it could be your story. It's not your story. I'm willing to bet you know someone that that's exactly their story. And so if that is you today, here's my suggestion, my encouragement to you as we see it from Luke 24. Give in to the wonder. Be willing to be curious. Be willing to ask questions, even if they're filled with doubt. And just try to search. Just begin searching for this Jesus that so many have talked about. And if you would just give in to the power of wonder and the willingness to search for Jesus, I think just like this story, at some point, in some way, you will find a life-changing discovery of a living hope. For others of us in here, perhaps it's a question of Jesus is a habit. He's a routine. A custom, right? The only reason, the only reason the women got up to go to the tomb that day is because it was their custom. Right? They weren't compelled by hope. They weren't looking for a resurrected Christ. They were doing the habits and the routines that they had learned growing up. This is what you do when someone dies. 
For them, Jesus was still dead. Their, their pursuit of him at this stage was purely out of habit. Is that you? Now that one I think might land with more of us. That for a lot of us, we're here, but if we're honest, our view of Jesus has limited to no wonder, limited to no searching because it's just a routine. It's what you do. And if that's you, I would hope and pray that perhaps this story can break through the habit, disrupt the routine, and ignite just a little bit of wonder in you. That it would pique a certain curiosity that, that starts a searching. And in that searching, you too, like the rest of us, can have the opportunity to discover this life-changing hope. Maybe for some of you, it's not a habit. Maybe it's not nonsense, but it's confusing. Right? And, and again, I think this is a pretty common one. You think about how the women wondered initially. Well, it was driven by confusion. Right? Maybe some of you, you you've seen the evidences, you, you've caught glimpses of it here and there, but you can't make it add up. It doesn't make sense. You have too many doubts, too many curiosities, too many things that you just can't quite get to fit. And so Jesus is confusing to you. If that's you, let me encourage you, don't stop seeking. Don't stop wondering. Trust that though God may reveal himself in different ways, maybe you'll be blessed with a visitation from the angels, or maybe it's just one more clue that's like strips of linen. If you keep that wonder going, if you keep that searching going, I assure you at some point it will result in that life-changing discovery of a living hope. Right? For others of you in here, Jesus is astonishing. Right? There's a surprise to it. There's a joy to it. You're like Peter. Right? You may not fully understand it and grasp it, but you want it and you want to see it for yourself and you're hungry for it. You're hearing that message and you're running after him. Your search for Jesus right now is relentless and it is fueled by that hunger. And if that's you, I want to tell you, keep running and run hard. Because when you look at Peter and you look at his story and you watch how it unfolds, and you see what God does with his life and the impact that he has once he actually understands all that has been done through the resurrection, what it shows us is that God can take that hunger in our hearts and do remarkable things. So give in to the wonder. Give in to that relentless pursuit. Keep searching and you'll find that life-changing hope. And then the last one. For many of us, and I hope a majority of us in here, Jesus is risen. And we, like the women, have hopefully moved from seekers to messengers. And the wondering that fuels us now is how do I take this life-changing, living hope and share it? The wondering that fuels us is we wonder who else needs to know. The seeking that fuels us is searching for those that need to hear that we might be ambassadors of this message, he is risen. And if that's you, I want to encourage you this morning, be that sort of person that lives with that sort of wonder, lives with that sort of commitment, lives with that sort of searching. That's the sort of church I want us to be, that we can't help but be fueled by this message of life-changing hope. And so my point is this, regardless of where you are, recognize the value of the hope of the words, he is risen. Let your life be one that never stops searching for that hope, for how that hope can change your life and direct it. Let us always be a church and a people that embraces the power of wonder. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love you. And we thank you for who you are and all that you do for us. God, I pray that you would ignite that sense of wonder in every single one of us. God, that though our journeys may look different, though our pursuits may vary from one person to the next, God, that you would ignite within this church and all those that are gathered here today a relentless pursuit of you. 
God, fuel our, our curiosity. Add to our questions. And give us the sort of conviction and the determination not to cast you aside and dismiss you as nonsense, but to see the living hope that is offered to your children, to see this incredible story of victory over death. God, let us be a people that searches and wonders for your truth, that we might be ambassadors for it. God, that we could be a church that truly is shaped by this hope, compelled by this hope, and are ambassadors of this hope. We thank you that you are a God who reveals, you are a God who saves, you are a God who draws us in. In our pursuit, in our wonder, may we glorify you each and every day of our lives, that you might receive the glory that you so richly deserve. We thank you, Father, and we pray all these things in the strong, precious, and holy name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want to invite you into a time of response uh, and encourage you that if there's a commitment that you need to make or you want to make uh, today, then make it before the Lord. Uh, if you want to share that commitment with somebody, we've got deacons that are come forward that will come forward and be available to pray. Uh, maybe that's something like you want to be baptized and you feel in the Lord prompting you towards that and you need to share that with somebody. Maybe it's a commitment towards service or commitment towards your family or whatever it is. If there is something the Lord is putting on your heart uh, that you want to search, that you want to seek out, then come forward and, and offer that up as a time of prayer. Uh, for the rest of us, Regardless of what it may look like, we want to continue to offer up our praise and our voices to our God to give him the glory that he deserves. And in so doing, let us be fueled by the hope of which we're going to be singing about here in just a moment. Let's stand and lift our voices together. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings called me His own. I am forgiven, confused forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free.
the promise your buried body began to bring out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory What a blessing that we have a hope that never perishes, spoils, or fades. So whatever awaits you on the other side of those doors, on the other side of this morning, know that you can go with that sort of hope that sustains you and encourages you. And so let us pray that that hope would be the foundation of our lives as we dismiss here today. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for the gift of wonder. We thank you for the gift of searching and that you are a God that wants to be found by those that earnestly seek you. And so as we have sought and as we continue to search, God, we are so grateful for this hope that is living and breathes within us by your spirit and the good news of Jesus, our Lord, who has defeated the grave. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for that hope. Use it fully within us now and forevermore. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you all for being here today. Go in peace, and we will see you again soon.